we've been going through and talking about how does somebody translate the passage? How does a translator pat translate? And we have gone through various steps and and different aspects that affect translation. So last time we talked about textual criticism, number six, and here we are in number seven, which is making the best choice with the available resources. This was an interesting thing for me to recognize that basically scholarship is always progressing. So that is one of the fascinating things for me about being a historian is uh, I always thought history was boring. I don't know if you were one of those people, but I thought that history was boring because for me, history meant that I went to school, I opened up my textbook and we read the textbook. And I just thought, you know, what's, what's kind of the point of this? Like it's a bunch of stories and the stories are interesting, but this is like a lot of facts. And as I started to study history more in depth, I realized that What's really exciting about history is that we're always grasping at becoming closer to history. So history happened, but the sources that we have to describe it are imperfect. Now, I'm not talking about the Bible, I'm talking about history. The sources we have to describe history are imperfect. You know, they're, they're biased. Sometimes people make things up. And that to me is what is so exciting about history is that you get to jump in to the resources, to the sources, and try and figure out what did actually happen and challenge other historians and say, wait a minute, you know, you, you said that, that this is how that event took place, but, you know, that contradicts this new letter we just found, right? So, so now we can enhance our understanding of what took place historically. Well, what's fascinating is to come to the realization that as humans, our knowledge is imperfect. That's just kind of how the situation goes. Our knowledge is imperfect. And so because of that, we miss things and we have to keep striving to come closer and closer. And so what we are going to recognize in tonight's class is that our knowledge of Greek and Hebrew and their manuscripts is in some cases imperfect. Now, again, I want to emphasize, as I always have, this does not affect the gospel. So this does not bother me because of that. I find this kind of interesting to see, really for me, it's motivating to say, this is why we want to study and learn more, because there's still unanswered questions. Okay, so what I want to underline here before we progress is, again, just a reminder that the big thing, the crucial thing, is that the context really determines how we translate. So again, knowing Greek and Hebrew is helpful understanding the things that we're talking about tonight in class is helpful, but really the key is looking at the context, which is something that all of us can do regardless of our abilities in Greek and Hebrew. All right. We have five sections of tonight's class, but some of them will go pretty quick. We're going to talk about band-aids, um, which I guess isn't entirely what we're discussing. We're not going to be literally talking about band-aids, but basically how translators sometimes have to put band-aids on their translation because they don't actually know how to translate a passage. So that's sort of a funny thing to look at. Then I'm going to give you some examples of that. So we're going to talk about Genesis chapter 12 in the promises to Abraham when it says all nations of the earth. We're going to talk about Saul, King Saul, when he became king. He was, according to the Hebrew at least, he was a baby, which doesn't quite make sense. We'll also talk about Lamentations chapter three, when Jeremiah says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Those are some Old Testament examples of passages that translators don't know how to translate yet. And then we're gonna talk about Greek verbs and how Greek verbs have thrown translators for a loop in some of their nuances. This is the main message here. Translation involves working with things we don't know. And again, for me, 
I have found this foray into Bible translation. I have found this to be so humbling because I used to look at people who used a different translation than me and say, oh, well, you know, they obviously haven't learned, you know, what's best. And now I'm realizing, oh, no, wait, it's because I hadn't learned. It was my lack of knowledge that was causing that pride to want to judge others. So here's an interesting question. Why question for you. Why did Saul die at three years old? King Saul. Now, you might not totally understand what, what that's talking about, so I'll enlighten you here. The Hebrew text tells us, and we'll look at the verse shortly, Hebrew text tells us that Saul only lived for three years. And not only that, but that for a couple of those years, he was king. So we got to try and figure that out. So the last two classes looked at how new discoveries have changed our views. And what this class is going to look at is how we are looking for some new discoveries still. It's sort of going along the same spectrum here. You know, since the time that the King James was written, new scholarship has unearthed various uh, understandings, new methods, and that has increased our understanding. But there are still things that we don't yet know. And so there are still verses that we don't really know how to translate. So let me give you an example of what this looks like. So we want a translation of the Bible, right? We don't want a Bible that has like holes in it or something because a translator says, well, I didn't really know what to do here. So what ends up happening is that a translator therefore says, well, I don't totally know what to do, so I'm going to do the best I can. And they'll give you a translation. Now, sometimes they will give you footnotes and they'll say, well, I didn't know really what to do. Um, and that's why, like, you know, if you're reading the King James and you have a marginal note, you'll notice sometimes it says Hebrew reads, right? And it will tell you. This is actually what the Hebrew says. What the translators are saying there is the Hebrew didn't make any sense to us. So we didn't put it down, but here's what, here's how the Hebrew would translate. Okay. So because they aren't really sure what to do, they often have to try and come up with some kind of solution for some of these verses. Again, there's not a lot of them. There's a few though. So Erasmus is an interesting example and the first edition of his Greek text. So Erasmus is the one who compiled a Greek New Testament text. And it was that New Testament text that the King James was eventually based on. Now, it went through numerous renditions and uh, other scholars went and improved upon it, but Erasmus kind of created the foundation. So he ran into an interesting problem when he was working through Revelation, and that was that there weren't a lot of copies of Revelation around. So what he did is he got a hold of a text of Revelation, a Revelation manuscript, and it actually was a commentary, but it had the manuscript in it, in the Greek, and he started to use that as his basis. Problem was, this was in 1516, and that manuscript that he was able to get a hold of had been damaged. And so because it had been damaged, it was actually missing a few lines of the text of Revelation. So you can see there in the picture, that's Erasmus's Latin notes to his New Testament text. And it translates to, this is from 1516. He says, however, at the end of this book, Revelation, I found some words in our versions, that is in the Vulgate, which were lacking in the Greek copies, but we added them from the Latin. So what Erasmus is talking about is essentially he's saying, I had to do my best. So I knew these were supposed to be there. There was a hole in my Greek manuscript. So, you know, I could tell that there was supposed to be something there, but I didn't have any Greek. So I couldn't uh, figure out, you know, what the Greek was supposed to be. So instead he says, I uh, took the Latin and translated the Latin into Greek. So he back translated these few verses of Revelation. So he elaborates later in a letter 
He says, because the book of the apocalypse never found much favor with the Greeks, it is rare among them. Hence, since I did not want anything to be missing from our edition, I extracted with some difficulty a very old codex containing commentaries on this work from the famous scholar Johann Ruschlin. From it, I had the words of the text copied out. But at the end of these words, but at the end, these words had been omitted by the carelessness of the scribes. And if anyone shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things which are written in this book. So Erasmus is saying his manuscript, his Greek text was missing that part, which is, I don't know if you caught that. It's kind of ironic that the part that his manuscript was missing was, if anyone will take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life. <laughs> so anyway, that was what was missing in Erasmus's manuscript. So he admits this, and so then he explains what he did. He goes on to say, I realized what had caused the scribe to make a mistake. Since the words in this book are repeated, like the, the Greek words, quote, the words in this book are repeated, his eyes skipped to the second phrase, omitting what was in between. So he's saying that phrase in this book happens twice, and the scribe, instead of writing the whole thing, ended up going from the first in this book to what came after the second in this book. It was just a mistake. Indeed, no stumbling block frequently trips up, more frequently trips up scribes. There's no doubt that the words have been omitted and there were only a few. To avoid leaving a lacuna or a, a hole in my text, I supplied the Greek out of our Latin version. I did not want to conceal this from the reader, however, and admitted in the annotations what I had done. My thought was that the reader, if he had access to a manuscript, could correct anything in our words that differed from those put by the author of this work. And yet, I would not have dared to do in the Gospels or even in the Apostolic Epistles what I have done here. The language of this book is very simple, and the content has mostly a, a historical sense, not to mention that the authorship was once uncertain. Finally, this passage is merely the conclusion of the work. So this is actually a letter here. Um, from somebody who's attacking Erasmus because of what he did. So this is why Erasmus is kind of explaining, you know, here's what I did. It's him working with a Band-Aid, right? Okay, and eventually he's able to fix it in case, you know, you were concerned and you felt like, oh, I read out of the King James and, ah, you know, this was based on a Greek text that actually came from the Latin in these verses. It's really not that big of a deal. He eventually was able to correct it. Um, so he fixed it. But my point is, is that he had to do the best with what he had. And once more resources became available, he fixed it. And that's really scholarship on the text and on Hebrew and Greek. That is scholarship in a very compressed form. You know, Erasmus was able to do it in his lifetime. But with a lot of these issues, it takes decades, centuries sometimes for scholarship to kind of figure out, oh, that's what this really means. That's kind of the nuance that's being brought out here. So that's a helpful thing to understand. So I want to give you an example of what this actually looks like then in our Bibles. So that was an example with Erasmus, but let's talk about this all nations of the earth phrase. So take a look at this. This is Genesis chapter 12, verse three in the King James, probably fairly familiar. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, see if you notice a difference. This is the RSV. The RSV says, I will bless those who bless you. Him who curses you, I will curse. And by you, all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. Do you see the difference there? In the King James, you have all families of the earth being blessed through Abraham. But in the RSV, you have all families of the earth blessing themselves. And you might look at that and think, like, what does that even mean, blessing themselves? And what it appears to, to be indicating here is um, that in ancient times, people would be blessed via other people. For instance, in the book of Ruth, you might remember that Ruth is blessed by saying, may you be like Tamar, that kind of thing. It's, it's the idea that all families of the earth will bless themselves in the name of Abraham. So they will use Abraham's name as a blessing. So those kind of mean different things, right? The King James is saying, 
all families will be blessed through you. And the RSV is saying all families will use you as a blessing. We'll use your name as a blessing. So which is it? Well, some versions have decided to offer both options. The NIV says all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So it goes to the King James idea. But then in a footnote, it says all people on earth will use your name and blessings. So the NIV tries to do both with a footnote. ESV says, in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. So again, it goes with the King James idea. But then with a footnote, it says, all families of the earth shall bless themselves. So the NIV and the ESV try to do both. The difficulty is that scholars really don't actually know which it should be. Grammatically. So according to the Hebrew, it's hard to know. The reason is Hebrew has something that's called binyanim. And those of you in my Hebrew class will recognize our, our uh, binyanim discussions that we've had. So binyanim are a funny kind of form of verbs. And Hebrew grammarians are still trying to figure out exactly what the binyanim mean uh, and, and kind of the ideas that they convey. So let me read you this quote and try and explain what's going on here with this whole Binyani idea. The matter is further complicated, this is talking about Genesis 12, by the usage of the Nifal. So the Nifal is, a, is one of the Binyani in Hebrew. The Nifal of Barak, or bless, in three other passages which record God's promise to Abraham and his descendants. So they are Genesis 12, 3, which is the one we're looking at, Genesis 18, 18, Genesis 28, 14. The Nephal and Hithpael, so this is now introducing another binyanim. So it's talking about these two different kinds, of these forms of verbs. It says they appear to be interchangeable or equivalent in these promises. So the, the point that this is bringing out is that in the promises to Abraham, the form of the verb actually changes over the course of the book of Genesis. Sometimes it's a Nephal verb, other times it's a hit pile verb. So scholars look at it and they're kind of like, well, that makes it sound like it's kind of the same unless, you know, something else being brought out here. So Chisholm here, Robert Chisholm goes on to say, as with the hit pile, scholars have debated whether the nifal in these texts is passive. So passive meaning that something is being done to Abraham, like, uh, they will be blessed through you. It's passive, not being done to Abraham, sorry, being done to the nations. They will be blessed through you. Or is it reflexive or reciprocal? Reflexive meaning that they do it to themselves. So you can see maybe the two translations there. Passive would be all nations blessed in you. Reflexive would be all nations bless themselves. And people aren't sure which it is. Is it passive or is it reflexive? There's not enough instances of this word barach, this word bless in the nifal, to be able to figure it out. As it says here, unfortunately, the nifal of barach occurs only in these three texts, making a survey of usage impossible. So you can't go through and say, oh, okay, here's how the nifal for barach is used in these other passages. Therefore, that's going to help us translate it. It's only used in these three places all on the promises. Okay, now here's where it gets really exciting. When the blessing is quoted in Genesis 22, 18 and 26 verse four, it uses a different form, that Hittite form. And that form is usually reflexive as in will bless themselves. So if you're just gonna go off the Hebrew grammar, what the Old Testament seems to be showing is that all nations of the earth will bless themselves is correct. That's what the Hebrew grammar appears to be saying based off the fact that it's quoted later in Genesis 22, 18 and 26 verse four, and the form changes to the reflexive form, meaning bless themselves. So it seemed like Genesis 12 is probably talking about blessing themselves. Here's where it gets exciting. <laughs> 
in the Septuagint, it reads like this. And in you, all the tribes of the earth will be blessed. So the Hebrew seems to indicate that it's all the tribes of the earth will bless themselves. But the Septuagint takes it as a passive. So the Septuagint says all tribes of the earth will be blessed. And you might say, okay, well, you know, who cares about the Septuagint? Septuagint has all kinds of like issues. Well, the problem is, is that the Septuagint is what gets quoted in the New Testament when Genesis 12 is quoted. So in Galatians 3.18, when the apostle Paul quotes the promises to Abraham, guess what he says? He says, and in you, all the tribes of the earth will be blessed. There is no discussion about that. It's very clear he is using it as a passive. So you look at this and you say, okay, well, now what do we do? The Hebrew grammar, the Old Testament seems to indicate that it's reflexive. All nations of the earth will bless themselves. And the New Testament seems to indicate that it's passive. All the tribes of the earth will be blessed. You know, and that's not very fun, you know, trying to figure out like, how do you, how do you explain the fact that the Old Testament seems to indicate something different than the New Testament? Those aren't really the kind of situations that we like to be in. So here's a possible solution. It should be noted, that should have a quotation at the front, by the way, should be noted that even if a reflexive bless themselves is preferred here, it would also carry the implications of a middle or passive. For if those who bless Abram are blessed and all families of the earth bless Abram, then it follows that all families will be blessed or find blessing in him. What this commentator here is saying is that if you take this as being reflexive, if you go along with kind of the, the Hebrew sense, then you can extract the passive sense, the New Testament sense, out of what's in the Hebrew. In other words, he's saying it's both. My point here in bringing this out to you is to say that Hebrew grammarians, people who do this for a living, you know, every day, every year of their life, are still confused about this. So, you know, I've come to the conclusion, I think it's both. And I think that that's how the Hebrew and the Greek come together. But there'd be a lot of grammarians who would disagree because, you know, there isn't an agreement about this. And that's kind of the point, that there are still things that we don't know yet. And so while I think it carries both, we have to have the humility to acknowledge, eh, we don't, we don't know everything about translation. So what we do is we put marginal notes in, we do footnotes and we do the best we can. All right, let's talk about Saul. This is my favorite example here. So how old was Saul when he became king? Well, it depends on what translation you read. So let's take a look. How old was he when he became king and how long did he reign? Take a look. If you're reading the King James in 1 Samuel 13 verses 1 to 2, you'll read this. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, dot, 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 he went and he invaded and fought against the Philistines. Now, the King James guys kind of finagled with the text here a little bit, and they added some words that aren't actually there in the Hebrew in order to try and make it make sense, because it's very confusing. This is probably the most confusing translational verse in the Bible. Here's what the ESV has done with it. <laughs> they tried to be highly literal. So the King James added a word or two. The ESV said, you know what? We're just going to go for it and put in what the Hebrew text says. So here's the ESV. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel. Huh. So, so that's a fairly um, literal translation of that. Here's the New American Standard. Check this one out. Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned for 42 years over Israel. Now, if you're asking, 
where did 30 come from? And where did 42 come from? Those are some good questions to ask because um, they're not actually in the Hebrew. <laughs> so the New York American Standard just stuck those numbers in. The NIV did something similar. Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned over Israel 42 years. So there's a lot of problems here with this. Okay. First of all, there is how old Saul was when he became king. So some translations say 30, others say that he was one. And then there's how long he reigned. Some translations say two years, some say 42. Okay, so let's take a look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew literally reads, Saul was one year old when he became king. He reigned for two years over Israel. So you can see why there's problems with this. Like you can see why the King James guys and the ESV added that word when, because obviously Saul was not three years old when he died. And yet that's what the Hebrew says. Now, <laughs> like no wonder why translators weren't sure what to do with this. Now, the King James translators tried to make this specifically about 1 Samuel 13. That's unlikely because this is a kingly formula. Do you remember in the book of Kings, this is just how Kings works. It says, Amaziah was blah, blah, blah years old when he became king, and he reigned for this many years. Hezekiah was this many years old when he became king, and he reigned for this many years. That's the exact same formula in the Hebrew. It's the same structure and everything here for Saul. This is Saul's kingly formula. Saul was this old when he became king and he reigned for this many years you can just match it up with the hebrew of all these other verses here this is saul's oh that's my translation jch and then you can compare it with ishbosheth you can compare it with david it's the same formula they all start with bane number of years bane number of years etc same thing same formula. So here's an interesting explanation of what's going on here. This is from an article in the journal Hebrew Studies. It says, it has long been assumed, especially because in many manuscripts, a gap appears before, between the words Bain and Shana that the number indicating the age of Saul has somehow fallen out. Because of the reading of some Septuagint texts, Shalishim is often assumed to be the missing figure. Shalishim translates to 30. So that explains why the NIV and the NASB have 30, because that's what the Septuagint says. But one must always be cautious in reconstructing the Hebrew text from the Septuagint. The question must also be asked whether a 30-year-old Saul could have a son old enough to be a military leader, as Jonathan clearly is at this time, right? Because Jonathan was probably in his early 20s, so, eh. What I find interesting, though, about this article is it explains that there's a number of Hebrew manuscripts that actually have a gap here, indicating that something is missing from the verse, now, as far as the second number, if you wondered where the 42 comes from, it actually comes from Paul, because Paul in Acts chapter 13 states that Saul reigned for 40 years. Now, the problem is, again, is that the Hebrew says two. So what ends up happening is translators take the 40 from Paul, what Paul says, and they add the two from the Hebrew onto it. And that's why the NASB and the NIV say 42 which I don't know how you feel about that. I kind of feel like that's probably like the worst of both worlds because not only does 42 disagree with what Paul says, it also then disagrees with what the Hebrew manuscript says. So it, that doesn't really seem to me to be a real good solution to the problem. Um, but again, at this point, we have to work with what we have, which is essentially nothing. So, you know, the theory that I came up with is maybe God specifically wrote it like this and wrote gaps into the record, caused there to be gaps here about Saul to underscore the deficiency of Saul's reign. Like he was so bad, he doesn't even get 
a full kingly formula. You know, Saul was blank years old when he became king and he reigned for like two years, you know, just to try and say like, that's how lame this reign was. So that's a thought. But again, we can't be dogmatic about this because there isn't a solution. We don't know yet. So this is where we want to take a look and look deeper. All right, here's, a, here's another piece of the puzzle. Uh, if you really like this verse, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to ruin it for you. Um, in the King James, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a suggestion by the end of this that I think really makes everything good. Okay, so, so just hold tight. So Lamentations 3.22 in the King James reads, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So remember, Lamentations is a book that Jeremiah writes when Jerusalem is being destroyed by the Babylonians or has been destroyed by the Babylonians. And so he's very sad, upset. And he says here in Lamentations that he reminds himself and he takes heart remembering this, that it's of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Now compare that with the English standard. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Have you ever noticed how different those are? You know, at least for me, I grew up reading the King James. And so I always read, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And then in, in 2003, when the Green Hymn Book came out and we started singing the steadfast love, of the Lord never ceases, you know, we like sing that song, or the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, right? Sorry, I was thinking of a different song. When we sing that verse from the newer translations, I found myself thinking, well, wait a minute, that's really different than what the King James says. It's of the Lord's mercies we're not consumed versus his steadfast love never ceases. What about the not consuming part? Where'd that go? It just like disappeared from the verse. The NIV says, because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. So it has that consuming idea. The NASB doesn't. The Lord's acts of mercy indeed do not end. So what's going on? Well, here is what the Hebrew says. This is my translation. And you might notice, again, based on the Hebrew, why there's a bit of an issue with translating it. Let's take a look. The loving kindness of Yahweh that we are not consumed because his mercies do not fail. Do you notice that that's missing something? The loving kindness of Yahweh that we are not consumed. That, you know, it, it feels like it should say, it is the loving kindness of Yahweh that we are not consumed, or because of the loving kindness of Yahweh, we are not consumed, or something like that. But it doesn't. It just says the loving kindness of Yahweh that we are not consumed. So the first section is a dependent clause, meaning it needs something else to make it make sense. And this is poetry. So there's supposed to be parallelism between the two sections of the verse, but there isn't. The loving kindness of Yahweh that we're not consumed because his mercies do not fail. Those don't really parallel each other. They're not describing the same thing. So translators find themselves asking, how else can this be read? You know, how, do, how can we actually make sense of what's going on in this? So what the ESV and NASB have done is very creative. They have come to this conclusion that it should be the loyal love of Yahweh does not cease. His compassions do not come to an end. Here's why. Most Hebrew manuscripts read, because of the loyal love of Yahweh, we are not cut off. Rather than the loyal love of Yahweh does not cease. The latter, which is what the ESV and NASB have chosen, the latter reading requires an emendation of the Hebrew word. In other words, they have to change one of the Hebrew words. Now, before you get all up in arms about that, they have a reason for it. The reason is because that change is supported by the Septuagint, by the Syriac, and by the Targums. Let's talk about what those things are. So Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The Syriac is a very early translation of the Hebrew into Syriac. Uh, 
And the Targums are an Aramaic, an early Aramaic translation, uh, dynamic translation of the Old Testament. So what this is saying is that these three translations all read as though the Hebrew has that emendation, has that change. Here's the change. Many commentators read Tamu instead of Tam Nu. So this is the change. They changed Tam Nu in the Masoretic text, that's the MT. They changed Tam Nu to Tamu. And so they go along and they explain again the Targum and the Syriac, etc. Okay. So they essentially get rid of that letter. So that one letter there, they say that shouldn't be there. And that solves both problems. It then reads, the loving kindness of Yahweh does not end. His mercies do not fail. You get the parallelism. Everything fits. It all makes sense. And it matches other manuscripts. So surely the loving kindness of Yahweh does not end. Surely his mercies do not fail. So that's how you can translate that. And that's what the ESV and the NASB go on to do. So some translators say, yeah, that's the best solution. You know, it fits other manuscripts. It makes sense. It upholds the parallelism. There you go. Problem is, is that nobody can explain where this word tamnu came from. Why do you have to get rid of a letter? How did it change? Nobody can figure that out. And if you don't have an explanation, you know, it's not real good to say, ah, here's the solution to our problem. But, uh, you know, I can't really explain how the problem originated in the first place. That doesn't work real good. So instead, the King James Version translators and the NIV translators add a word. They add the word key, which reads, it's of the Lord's mercies. We are not consumed because his compassions fail not. And so they add the word here that makes it read, it is of the Lord's mercies, or because of the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, for compassions never fail. So they add a word. So basically, translators are kind of stuck, just fig trying to figure out, uh, you know, what do I do? We either have to add a word or take out a letter, right? What do, what do we do with that? So neither translation possibility fits super well. However, here's my suggestion. In Hebrew, you are allowed to add the words, it is. So the King James added, it is of, which is not something you typically do in translation. So you wouldn't add that word of or, or the word because, but you can add, it is. Hebrew doesn't have a verb for the word is, so it's often just implied. So this is how I would translate it, which I think gives a really powerful sense. It is is the loving kindness of Yahweh that we are not consumed because his mercies do not fail. In other words, what Jeremiah is saying is not that it's, he's not saying it's because of God's mercies that we're not consumed, but he's saying it is God's mercy that we're not consumed. This is a tangible, powerful illustration in my own life of the mercy of God. So you'll see that some scholars support that too. <laughs> so again, people don't know. We're not sure. In all of these, we do our best. And to know more definitively, we need more discoveries and research. Now, here's something that you might find interesting. Let's talk about the New Testament real quick. Basically, in the last 10 years, 15 years or so, scholarship has essentially exploded on what the Greek verb means. Um, this is it's a pretty crazy kind of field. Uh, some scholars are questioning whether or not it includes time. Like in, in uh, English, past tense means it happened a long time ago. Future tense means it will happen in the future. In Greek, there's now this question of, does it actually include time? You know, so, so the Greek verb is basically being like overhauled. So this is what was written in 1996. It says, it's not altogether clear that tense is a very accurate way of referring to the Greek tenses. The word tense calls up notions of time, present tense, future tense, and so forth. But suppose a verb form is morphologically present tense, 
Well, not in fact referring to present time, but to past time. What he's saying is, if you have a verb that is grammatically present tense, but contextually it clearly is not present tense, what do you do with that? You know, what do you make of that? This is this happens all the time. Those of you in my Greek class, you perhaps have seen this. This happens all the time in Greek. And so Greek scholars have just come up with this category that they call the historical present. Like that's an oxymoron, right? That doesn't even make sense. And so, so Greek scholars are now starting to realize, oh, like, wait a minute, maybe Greek doesn't actually have time in the verb. So that was in 96, right? So that's what Carson wrote. Now, this guy comes along, Constantine Campbell, and he builds on what Carson wrote in 2015. So now here's what he's saying. Over the past 30 years, Greek scholarship has undergone a series of paradigm shifts, the likes of which have not been seen in the preceding century. The application of modern linguistic methodologies, lexical and lexicographical advances, the rejection of deponency, the rise of discourse analysis, verbal aspect, and idiolect, register and genre studies have all changed the face of the study of Greek. No other single source gathers these issues together. So what he does in his book is he talks about all these different things. Lexicographical advances, rejection of deponency. He talks about how our understanding of the Greek verb has changed all in the past 30 years. And again, there still isn't agreement. So here's somebody else coming along and saying, you know, he even mentions Campbell. There's Campbell right there. He comes along and says, look, all these different scholars disagree about how to translate the Greek verb. Okay, so what's this all mean for us? Well, it means we do the best we can. It means that we know the gospel because these things don't affect the gospel. But it means we have to approach the text with humility. Yes, we can be dogmatic about first principles because that's the gospel. We know what that says. We know that without any question. But we can't be dogmatic about other things because we're still learning. And I think for me, that is the absolute most powerful point that comes out of this is acknowledging I don't know everything and we don't know everything. And so when we talk to each other, that should create within us an attitude that says, oh, how do you understand this passage? Why? An attitude that wants to know, that wants to ask questions rather than to say, oh, well, here's how I understand it. And this is right. And you're obviously wrong. This should create within us a humility that acknowledges that God knows and we still have more to learn. Thank you.